Hey everybody, welcome to Ryan Rants. I'm your host, Ryan Shedd, and boy do I have a cool show for you today. I have an outstanding group of ladies here with me today. Um, they're from the group Sex Education for a Change. How are you ladies doing today? Doing well, good. how are you? I'm doing good. I'm actually excited for the show, so thank you for coming on. Um, but before we get started with all the seriousness, because this is admittedly going to be a, a pretty serious show, I wanted to start off with something kind of fun, just to remind everybody to go get your vaccines. So take a look at this. I thought this was great. In the Big Ten, ninth nationally, the sophomore from Kansas City, top score of 14.75 against the Buckeyes. Same vault as Diab. Oh, and he sticks a landing. Not sure what that is. I think it's vaccine. Vaccine card. <laughs> Whatever. That's right. Pull out that vaccine card after that. <laughs> That's a power move in itself. Yeah, that, was a, that, was, that was that was a sweet flex. I loved it. All right. So, um, again, we're going to be talking about uh, SB 1456 is going to be our primary conversation today, right? So, before we do that, I wanted to get in, go ahead and uh, let you guys introduce yourself. So, Waris, I'll start with you. If you could just give everybody a rundown of yourself and, and what got you started with this particular organization. Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Boris. Um, I'm a junior at ASU. I'm studying biochemistry, math, and global health. Um, and I got interested in sex education just as I got older and had my own experiences with relationships and had friends um, who had experiences. And I got more comfortable talking to my parents about these kinds of things. I kind of realized how inadequate my um, school had, my education had been in school as far as um, sex education topics. And so I got really interested in bringing that um, into the system, improving it in the system so that there's an adult other than your parents who's well informed about sex education, who can teach you those things when you need to learn them. Outstanding. Um, all right. And we're going to move on to Kelly. Kelly, go ahead and tell us about yourself and why you got involved. Cool. My name is Kelly. I'm also a junior at ASU studying global health. And I got involved because I, I read a statistic that said that one in six women will be victims of rape in their lifetime. And I come from a family that has six girls. So for me, that meant that at least one of my sisters is likely going to experience that. And advocating for sex education was one way that I saw I could help be proactive in preventing that from ever happening to one of them or any other woman. So yeah. I'm happy to say that I, I think our work is starting to accomplish that. And I hope we can go even further to make sure that it stops happening to anybody. That's all. And, and I already told you that that particular story really hit hard with me when we talked about it the other day, because it's like women, you know, are going to experience you know, sexual assault, rape in their lifetime. And, and here you are saying that one in one person out of your family would likely suffer from this simply because of how many people you have in your household. That that's just profound. And I hope everybody pays attention to that because I've been posting a lot of videos about, you know, women being harassed and things like that lately. And that's why I think this conversation is so much more important. It's not just about sex education. Hopefully by the end of the show, you guys are going to understand where these ladies are coming from and, and why it's so important. And with that, I'm going to move on to Nancy. Go ahead and tell us about yourself. Um, I am currently a junior, um, as the other people stated, at ASU studying medical studies. Um, and I first started being involved in sex education in high school with Lee. Um, at that time, I had really no sex, um, no way to really talk about sex just because in my culture, it's a very taboo subject. And I realized that um, that stigma that we placed on speaking about um, sex education made it very difficult to make sure people are um, equipped with necessary information to make informed decisions about their own bodies. Um, in addition to that, I grew up in South Africa and I felt that I had very good sex education in terms of HIV um, prevention and more about what HIV is, but when I came to Arizona, a lot of my peers were lacking that information. So I really wanted to do my part in helping to inform other people, people about really essential information, which is essentially health um, education. Yeah, I, I really found, again, I found your story interesting, just be, you know, coming from a different culture, which a lot of people in, in this country don't get to experience. 
and you saying that you were actually far more educated on on sex education than we are, you know that that one really struck struck a chord with me too when we were talking the other day. Um, thank you again for sharing your guys' stories, Lee. I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it off to you. You finish us off here. Hi, I'm Lee Chaffel. I'm also a junior at ASU. Um, I started working on sex education in Arizona back in 2015. Um, I was a high school student and I was with a group of friends and we were having one of those kind of hushed conversations that were for some reason in the middle of the hallway and some of my friends were talking about you know sex and things that they didn't want overheard but they were saying some really inaccurate things. Um, one of my friends said, oh, my mom said that condoms aren't that effective, so why bother using them? And another said, oh, consent is so iffy. I think as long as somebody's not saying no, then you're good. And that seemed really scary to me because here are my friends, smart, educated people, and yet they've been given misinformation that could lead to somebody getting hurt or sick or, you know, something that would be really profound in their lives. And I realized I had gotten lucky because my mom is a nurse practitioner and she had sat me down a lot of times throughout my life to say, here are the facts, here's how you keep yourself safe. And I realized that my friends need that too. And so yeah. I started this group. I think it's awesome. Um, and, and, I, and I'm actually honored to have you guys on here and help spread your message. So. Um, for everybody that's on and going to listen, um, you can find these this this awesome group on Instagram at sex underscore education underscore for underscore a change on un all underscores. OK, sex education for a change with all underscores. And then their Twitter is uh, S.E.F.A.C. underscore A.Z. So make sure you go follow them so you can keep up with all the information they're putting out because they really do put out um, good information. I was. Um, Googling you guys, AKA um, internet stalking, just so I had some information. And um, you're, you're very impressive ladies. Um, so awesome, just freaking awesome. Uh, so we're gonna start with a video that you guys sent just to give us a little uh, headway into what we're gonna be talking about. And so let's listen to this. It's Jenny with Capital Watch and I'm here to give you the rundown on what's been happening at the Arizona Legislature. First off, there's a new abortion attack by the AZ GOP. Last week, we saw HB 2140 receive a strike all amendment, which turned the bill into an abortion attack bill. This bill now bans abortions before many people even know they're pregnant and criminalizes doctors and anybody assisting for performing these abortions. It also gives anybody who claims paternity the ability to sue for monetary gain if an abortion occurs. HB 2140 passed out of the Senate Appropriations Committee last Wednesday at about 8.40 p.m. We also have an update on the permanent early voter list purge bill that would kick hundreds of thousands of Arizonans off the list. SB 1485 was originally supposed to receive a vote last week, but did not end up receiving it. However, it can still be heard at any time, so it's important to stay alert and to keep contacting your legislators about the permanent early voter list vote. Today Apparently that's the wrong video. I could have swore that's the one y'all sent me. <laughs> My apologies. I have the link if you'd like to show it. I, I um, you can give it to me. Yeah. Um, I'll put it in the I have, Well, I have this, does this help? I don't know if that's this helps help. at all. We can put that, that up. does not help, okay. So I'm screwing up all over here, guys. I'm sorry. Um, so <laughs> no what, worries. So what do, what do you want me to do here? Because <laughs> all I had was um, just we're going to talk about SP 1456. I had pointed out that, um, well, let me ask you this. Let me go in another direction. What is the most, um, man, where did I put that? Wow, I'm really messing up here. I'm so sorry. Um, what's the most distressing or, or the dangerous part of this bill from your guys' perspective? Well, there's a lot of distressing things about this bill. One of the biggest issues is that it's changing Arizona's sex education system from an opt-out to an opt-in system. Mm -hmm. We believe that's really dangerous because it has the opportunity to leave out a lot of students. It also extends this change to any content discussing gender, gender identity, gender expression, and that's an attack on the LGBTQ plus community, because if we restrict 
discussion of gender or gender expression, then what happens is we sort of default to having um, cisgender people, meaning people whose gender correlates with their biological sex, they become kind of the default because they're the majority. And that's an issue because if we aren't talking about members of the LGBTQ plus community, we're not talking about transgender youth, then we're not promoting messages of acceptance. We're not promoting um, an accepting environment. And that's really important because um, transgender youth have high, high, high risks of suicide and they need a sex education as well that's tailored to them because they also are subjected to higher rates of sexually transmitted infections. So if you're not specifically talking about gender and the di diversity that is present in gender, then you're leaving out this whole group of students. Right. And yeah. Go Sorry. ahead. No, nope, go ahead. Uh, and I was just going to say, and to be clear, it, um, it restricts talking about gender and gender identity in all of your classes. It's not just related to sex education. So it's history classes, it's English classes. Um, so it's really restricting it on a lot of levels where you would not even hear about it at all in school. Um, and then another thing that um, is difficult with this bill um, that we don't like is that it prevents any form of sex education before fifth grade, which can be really harmful to child abuse prevention because um, teaching children good touch, bad touch um, and giving them adults that they know that they can safely report these things to is really important in preventing that. And then it also discriminates against girls who maybe start puberty a little earlier because girls tend to start a little earlier than guys, um, maybe get their period before fifth grade. Um, that's absolutely biologically possible. And we'd be leaving them out and not giving them the education they need about their own bodies. Yeah. Anybody else? It also I mean, carries the... I'm Sorry, Kelly. No. <laughs> Go ahead. You're good. <laughs> it also carries the assumption that all parents are as involved um, in their children's education to mm. be able to make an informed decision of opting in um, versus opting out. So not everybody has parents that are um, as as involved in whatever they are doing to be able to effectively opt in. And and I'm going to tell you what. I'm sorry. Did you have something too, Kelly? I'm sorry. No, she covered what I was going to say. She covered it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, the, the verbiage that got me was in, in the, the same page, there's the opt out, you know, that the opt out clause is already written, written into the bill that if you have a religious or any, uh, you know, any kind of uh, whatever reason that you don't want to do it, there's already an opt out clause. So, and in the same thing, I think it was like three lines down, they changed the verbiage to it being an opt in program. So if you can already opt out of it, why do you also have to write in the opt in? Right. That's exactly what we're talking about. And a lot of the language we're dealing with when we bring this to legislators who are in support of the bill is them saying that they're protecting parents' rights. Mm -hmm. And parents' rights is something we're all for. You should be involved in your child's education. You are currently involved in your child's edu education through that opt out system. So what the opt in system does is it's more similar to like a permission slip that you would need for a field trip. You have to get permission to have the education at all. And like Nancy mentioned for students whose parents maybe lost the paper, didn't get it signed in time, aren't present enough. The kid forgot the paper. There's a myriad of reasons why that paper might not get signed. And because of that, those students are going to be left out and they're not going to be afforded the education that should be a baseline piece of their health education anyway. It's um, it's really leaving space for students to fall between the cracks, which is not what we want to see happen. Yeah. And that for me, from where I'm sitting, you know, because this is all new to me, you know, I, I researched it because you guys were coming on the show. Um, that that's that's the most damaging part that I read is that you already have verbiage in there making an option, you know, for, for there's more than there's more than one sentence in here giving people a way out. Right. And, and it not being a, a, them not being penalized at all. So the only reason to make it an opt in program is for political reasons, you know, is for is because you don't like something or you don't understand or they don't understand something. And so therefore, let's just let's just do this and make it harder. Yeah. I mean, am, I, am I understanding it right? Absolutely. One of the big goals of this bill seems to be to make it harder to teach sex education. 
It also enacts um, a more lengthy, lengthy bureaucratic process for approval of a sex education program. Um, some people, in response to what Kelly said, some people will say, oh, it's not about a permission slip. It's something that happens when you sign your child up at school. But this bill would at the same time make it so that if you wanted to update your sex education curriculum, uh, that process would have to begin again. You'd have to send out the permission slips. It would never end because curriculum is constantly updating. Yep. Um, it would be almost impossible to teach sex education. Yeah, and the people that that burden really falls on a lot of the time are teachers, which they already have so much to do and in Arizona are already underappreciated, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's between teachers and administrators, all that extra work that they have to do is just a really big burden that they don't need to have to deal with. I'm actually glad you brought that up because the teachers, particularly here in Arizona, are are very underappreciated, underpaid, and and most of the schools are understaffed in some way, especially over the last year with the virtual learning. I think my kid, my one kid, went through two different teachers because they just they quit. So I mean, um, to add more onto the expectations that you know, or what we expect of our teachers, you know, of them to do is, I, I agree with you, Oris. I think it's crazy. We need to take things off their plate. You know, not not add more expectations. I don't know. Okay, sorry, I'm going off on it. That's why it's called Ryan Rants. I go off on weird rants. Sorry. Um, We're here for it. <laughs> so, what was the other thing I had? Why is there so much? There it is. Why is there so much verbiage in this bill about educating the parents about their rights? I think a lot of that verbiage is actually. There, it's in the bill, but it's really coming from the legislators themselves when they're defending it at hearings when we're trying to say, no, we don't want this. Um, and actually ending up, ending up having more people there to say no, but still having the bill pass when there were less people there to say yes. This parents' rights thing is not something that we want to inhibit. I do really, and I hope that my group agrees with me, I do really feel that it's a fear tactic. Um, the same way that some of the language in a sex ed curriculum can be scary if you don't really know what it's meant to talk about or meant to convey. Mm -hmm. Saying that your schools or the government or activist groups are trying to take away your rights as a parent, it triggers not only your want to maintain your own rights, but your right to or your want to want to prote protect your child. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really good trigger phrase to be like they're trying to take away your parental rights. Um, it just really gets people fired up when they don't have an, a holistic perspective of what's going on. So that would be my best guess as to why it's being brought up so much. Because as you said, that opt-out system gives parents the opportunity to be a, a participant in that part of their child's education. Yep. And and it's already there. Like it was already there before before they did all this, this reverted. Yeah, it's been there. Yeah, it's been there. Yeah. When I did mine, I remember having to take home the permission slip and um, or just the thing that said what we'd be learning and the slip that said, no, I don't want my child to do this if they didn't. Luckily, my parents let me, although there wasn't much in the curriculum to begin with, but yeah. I was allowed to do it. Um, yeah, well, I mean, for an example, well, for an example, I was in when I was in high school back in the 90s, <laughs> um, they had we had health class and, and in, we had the health class for, for a whole semester, but they only did one week. Uh, like a one week uh, course or whatever, or unit on sex education. And and like you said, Kelly, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty lackluster to say the least. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah had, I think we all got the, the scary pictures of STDs and saying, uh, um, hmm. what's, there's a scene in Mean Girls where he's like, don't have sex because you'll get pregnant and die. That's pretty much the extent of what the curriculum really says at this point. And that's what we want to change because it's not only is it inaccurate, it's dangerous to spread ideas about that. And there really are great benefits to having a more comprehensive curriculum. I, I think so too. And, and I don't know. And well, I'm going to say it anyway. I, the, the issue that I see is that we're, we're pushing abstinence, right? which is fine. I, like, I, Hey, I hope my daughter doesn't do it until she's 30. But is, is that the reality? Probably not. And therefore um, I think, I think this hope and, and prayer that that absence is going to solve all these problems. Um, but in, instead of educating, instead of, 
providing this these information in these classes i that that to me is just naive and and um dangerous in my opinion yeah. And it's actually the op opposite. Um, research has shown that comprehensive sex education actually leads to lower rates of unplanned pregnancies and teen pregnancies. Um, so there's evidence that abstinence only education does not do what it's trying to do. Mm. In addition and to that, go. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the same the same studies have shown that with a comprehensive sex education, people are more likely to wait to have their first sexual encounter, which is kind of counterintuitive for the people supporting this bill because people tend to think, okay, if you tell, if you tell people, you know, abstinence only, don't have sex, don't have sex, then people won't have sex, except you're teaching this to teenagers <laughs> and teenagers don't always do what they're told. I know I didn't. <laughs> But if they're educated about the consequences of their actions and about, you know, what is happening with their bodies and ways to keep themselves safe, then yeah. maybe they're more likely to do those rather than just being told, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think it's important, at least from where, again, from where I'm sitting, I think it's important for people like me, you know, and more men to hear from, from women, you know, how important you guys think it is. Because in a lot of ways, I think, I, I think I think men need to understand women better when it comes to this. And I don't I'm probably not saying that right, but does that make sense to you guys at all? Yeah. No, and I think it goes both ways. I think that um, you should learn about what's happening with the various bodies, no matter who they belong to. You should know what's going on biologically and emotionally. And um, when, you know, for instance, boys don't learn about menstruation, then there can be some really um, serious consequences. Um, there's a lot of stigma and a lot of stereotypes that kind of get propagated by boys who don't understand menstruation. Um, and those can be really harmful. And so it's really important that you do learn about both sides, um, all sides, and, um, and that you really understand them and that way you have less stigma you have fewer stereotypes because you actually know the facts rather than just trying to figure out what's going on and making stuff up yeah and and i'm going to tell you and i'm going to i'm actually going to take a second to plug what you sent me wars um i grew i was a, my dad raised me so it was just me and him and so i i kind of when when you sent me this i started thinking about what my dad would have done if i was a, you know if i had been a daughter a and but but more importantly, at what we're talking about today, I don't know why it just clicked when you were saying that. But um, I, I, my dad didn't know how to teach me half that stuff. He was a he was a guy, and when he was growing up, they didn't do that, you know. So having a program like this, you know, to teach me things like what you were just saying about my dad didn't teach me about the menstrual cycle. And if I'm being honest, it was a very you know he had a very misogynist viewpoint you know, on it and would make, you know, make a lot of stupid jokes about when women were, you know, were on their, their menstrual cycle, blah, blah, blah. And, and so that's how I was raised. And, and that's why one of my things is always growth is a choice, like educating yourself and, and realizing that's, you know, the way you viewed something was wrong or, you know, what you said was wrong. You know, that's, that's a choice. And so I, I, that's why I think, that's why I personally think this education, you know, bill is so dangerous because, it doesn't account for for everybody. It doesn't account for everything, and it's trying to not only does it not account for that, but it's trying to um, directly remove, you know, the rights of the LGBT community to health care and things like that. And it's just, it's very upsetting to me. It's very upsetting. All right, it's a precursor for worse things to happen. So it may look Ooh, like I an agree. innocent. Well, we're just switching to an opt-in system to expand parents' rights, or we want to make sure that we're not promoting the actions of the LGBTQ community, which is completely stupid. Uh, I, I shouldn't phrase it like that. No, but absolutely. It's, it, it's misinformed. It's misinformed, and it's assuming that people are not born who they are. It's assuming that there's an agenda to make people act one way or another, when in reality, you're just trying to provide tools to people. Yep. So by creating an opt-in system instead of an opt-out or leaving gender identity and gender expression out of the curriculum, you're opening up space for greater forms of disenfranchisement and other things. And that's part of why this is so dangerous. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I want to touch on what you said too about learning from your parents. Um, if sex education is left to the parents, a lot of them also didn't receive a great sex education, like you mm -hmm. said. And so they might not have the right information and might be providing misinformation to their kids as well. So that's one reason why I saw in my own education um, that it was it would have been important. I wish I had had an adult other than my parent who was well informed teach me this information. Um, I think that would and have been really helpful. Sorry. No, go. Um, You've been quiet. Can, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to add that sometimes it can be a lot um, more comfortable for people to communicate with like their teacher or somebody else that um, is not necessarily their parent because there may be that um, barrier to um, being as open as you can to and learn as much as you can. So sometimes that's why it's so helpful to have an outsider that's more informed, um, which we like parents have good intentions, but sometimes the education that they may be providing is um, misinformed and filled with some biases that they had from their bad sex ed. Yep. No, I'm glad you said that. That That's a good connection to make. Um, okay. So what, what can we do to help you guys uh, fight this? And, and, and let me, before we go into that, what, what is your guys' prediction? Do you think that this is going to happen, go through? Do you think we have a chance? I'd say there's always a chance. You know, you need to tell your legislators what you believe, how you feel about a bill, because they are there to represent their constituents. They are there to represent us as Arizonans. You know, we voted them into office. And so tell them what your opinion is. Um, and they may or may not vote that way, um, but at least they should be informed of what their constituents are thinking about. Um, so definitely reaching out to them, telling them your opinion is really important. And there's always a chance. There's It's it's not a 100% either way. Yeah. Right now we're targeting four people in specific in the legislature. Um, we're hoping to contact representatives Udall, Osborne, uh, Joel John, and Weninger because they seem to be, um, they seem to be willing to work for the LGBTQ community. Um, and we think that maybe by contacting them and having a lot of people say, hey, you know, as your constituents, we don't believe in this bill. We think it will hurt people. We're hoping that they'll step up and they'll say, oh, okay, you know, my, the people in the community are supporting me. And so I can stand up and say that this bill is bad because we ultimately, we need one Republican to stand with the largely Democrat uh, legislators. And if we have that, then we can take this bill down. Yeah, I, ho I hope it happens. I hope we can make it happen. And I'm gonna put this graphic up. So these are legislators that, uh, legislators that Lee was talking about that you can contact now. Uh, this information is also in the description of the show on YouTube and, and all the podcasts. So um, if you're listening or watching, you can go into the description and you'll see the phone numbers and, and all this exact same information in there. Um, and again, don't forget to go follow Sex Education for Change on Instagram and Twitter there. Um, so yeah, there's all the information. It's in the, it's in the description. But I also wanted to put up, War sent me this. Are you a single father? Do you have a daughter? And uh, this is this one is also in the description. Um, so if you do, there's a link here. And again, Wars, correct. As a matter of fact, Wars, go ahead and tell them about this. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so this is actually my thesis research project as part of being a Barrett Honors student. Awesome. Um, so what I'm doing is I am researching where single fathers with daughters are at with menstrual education, um, how much they know, how comfortable they are talking to their daughters about it. Um, and then the goal of the research is to then be able to meet fathers where they are and provide them with resources to better educate themselves and better educate their daughters about menstruation. So, so you're doing that. You're doing a project exactly what my dad, what I was telling you about my dad, who doesn't, yeah, he didn't know yeah. what he was doing. He's being single fathers, so they know what they're doing, so they can help support their daughters and hopefully their sons as well, if they have sons. You know, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, hopefully that that kind of you know made a connection for you. It's not just the daughters, you know. I mean, it, it's it's the sons too. We need to know, and you know, I, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you guys, I. I felt very ignorant when it came to women until, you know, I, until my wife really 
like, you know, until I lived with her and she really explained things to me and why, why certain things are the way they are and what she goes through and seeing what she goes through. And just, there were so many things I didn't understand <laughs> that would have helped me late, you know, earlier on in my life, uh, understand you guys better and, and be a better, I mean, I'll say a better ally, but just be better to all the women around me. Cause, cause there's an understanding there that needs to happen. And now that I have my daughter and my wife, I get that. And hopefully, you know, us having these podcasts and these, these conversations, you know, when I don't, when I don't mess up the beginning, hopefully that helps spread some awareness and, and gets more people engaged to understand, you know, that, that it is a problem. And, and, but more importantly, I don't think, I don't think I've talked enough about it on the episode. This is directly attacking LGBTQ uh, uh, kids. Like the, am I wrong here? You're not wrong at all. Okay. Um, in the committee hearing, some senators said, oh, it doesn't specifically highlight the LGBTQ community, but it's coded. Um, in the yeah. history of sex education, it's almost always been an attack on the LGBTQ plus community. Yeah. It would be illegal for them to say, we can't teach about LGBTQ topics. That's a violation of constitutional rights. So yeah. what they can say is what they put in this bill here. Um, and speaking so, to what you were- Go ahead. No, go ahead. Speaking to what you were saying about like learning from the women around you, it shouldn't take getting a girlfriend or a daughter or a wife um, for men to be able to learn a lot of these topics. Like if you want to be a good ally, there should be a space for you to be able to educate yourself. And sex education is a great way to do that. I, I, I talked about the six sisters already, but I have one little brother and he's growing up in a very fortunate position in that <laughs> aspect. Um, he's going to know a lot more than the, the men around him when he's growing up. And we already see him being an advocate and being able to say, no, what you guys are talking about isn't true, or that's not actually what happens to girls, which is really cool to see at like that's 10 awesome. years old. Um, so we're trying to create that space, but going back to the LGBTQ topic, it, it has to be an indirect attack. Um, they, they can't just explicitly say, we don't want to teach this. And, and just so the, the listeners have a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about. This is directly from SB 1456. This is the, the wording. Providing sex edu education instruction or instruction regarding sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression to the student when the public ed educational institution seeks consent, it shall at the same time inform the student's parent or guardian of the parent or guardian's right to review the, inst uh, the instructional materials and activities. So like you guys were saying earlier, basically, if they start to teach anything outside of, of male, female, whatever, they have to get a permission slip. Is that, is that right. basically it? And because the language is so broad, it could extend to things outside of sex education, which I think we a little touched on a little bit at the yeah. beginning. But if they want to teach about Stonewall riots or the history of the LGBTQ community and their activism, that that could fall into the realm or be deemed to fall into the realm of something that needs an opt in because it touches on gender identity, gender expression and all of those topics. So, well, and I think this bill will see the word, the wording and the next bill will extend, I think, to what you just said, Kelly, you know, they're the next time it's going, it's going to extend to history class and, and, you know, all this other stuff, it won't just be the sex education. This is just, yeah, if we don't squash this, it's going to set a really uh, crappy precedent in my opinion. Yeah, I also it make it add, so um, yeah. Oh, sorry. You're um, out, Nancy. <laughs> it could have very damaging effects on what we're able to learn in in our classrooms. And we want to be able to have information that is not filtered out um, because of this bill. Yep. Wow. You know, and, and I'm going to make it's a connection. It's kind of a different connection. But, you know, we've talked a lot about this in some of my other shows about the history that we were taught in school when I went to school versus what, what real history is like that we've learned now. And, and that, I think you really just hit the nail on the head, Nancy. That's what, that's exactly what this is. It's filtering out history, you know, because pe for people that don't understand, don't care to understand, don't want to be inclusive, whatever the reason is, they're filtering this out so that they just don't have to deal with it. Absolutely. It would also extend to things like the women's suffrage movement, because that was a gendered issue. It would, um, under this bill, it could even go to basic English, like when you teach maybe elementary school students about pronouns, like 
when they do the whole diagramming the sentence. Now you need a permission slip. And that's an issue because that's just basic English. That's crazy. Yeah, that to me, that, that one's just crazy. And we do want to emphasize that these are all potentials, right? They're not explicitly saying, we're going to take away parts of your history classes because yeah. we don't want to see them. And like, we definitely don't want to be on the other side of that and being like, they're trying to take away your history classes. But there is a space being created by this bill for that to happen. And that's a very real thing that exists. So it's important to note that whether or not it's intentioned or explicit, there's space for it. Well, and, and I like what you said earlier, Kelly, the, the vagueness of it, you know, we have, we really have to pay attention to the vagueness of these, of these bills, because like you said, it creates that space for, for the next step. So, you know, yeah, we don't want to be over reactionary and, and be the extremists on the other side, but at the same time, you know, we need to have our eyes open at, to what the next step would be, you know, as well, at least from where I'm sitting. Yeah, Absolutely. All right, ladies, anything else that I missed that we want to tell tell everybody out there? I'd like to emphasize the importance of having um, sex education before fifth grade again. Mm. Um, there's a lot of a lot of the time people against sex education will say, oh, a kindergartner doesn't need any sex education. Why would we teach kindergartners about putting on condoms or anything like that? But nobody wants to teach that. We're looking for an age appropriate sex education. And sex education in kindergarten is teaching about good touch, bad touch, teaching about how to identify a potentially dangerous situation, things like that. Um, you know, if something does happen, if somebody touches a child in the wrong way, making sure that that child knows how to tell an adult and making sure that they know that it's not their fault. Um, yep. And, and so you guys sent me something to post and I posted on my social media. I'm going to read you what somebody said in my comments. And, and I just want to know what you guys think. My daughter's in first grade and is constantly harassed by an older kid at school, calls her a bitch, ugly, et cetera. She's told every teacher and adult she's seen, uh, uh, sorry, she's told every teacher and adult she's seen when it happens. And she was told, well, we haven't seen or heard it. So maybe you're overreacting. Sadly, I feel like no matter what we do, kids like that turn into guys like the one in uh, the video that I posted in the comments. I told her to punch or push him if she needed to and that she wouldn't get in trouble. That was in the comments that's, of something yeah, that I posted of yours. That's heartbreaking to hear. So, and it's not I, a no matter what we do thing because there is something that can be done. And it doesn't start with, choosing or it does start with choosing to believe women or young girls when they say something's happening to them but beyond that it starts with teaching young boys who turn into young men how they should be treating people and what it's not okay to call a woman and the like teaching those very fundamental lessons of respect and consent early on we're not trying to show your kindergartner like we said how to put on a condom that's not what's happening we're trying to teach them the basic fundamentals that translate into things like rape culture when they're adults because there was a gap in their education. Yep. It's not okay for that young girl to be experiencing that, but what made that young boy ever believe that it was okay for him to treat her like that? What example did he see or what was set by what was around him without being counteracted by his education at school that, again, opened up the space for that to be occurring? Yeah. I just wanted – it was – I wanted to drive home the point that you, you know, Lee and you all are trying to make is that starting this at fifth grade is not early enough. And, and I saw more than enough comments from parents in, in, the, in my social media posts in the last couple of days to, to say that with a hundred percent confidence that, that that's just not early enough that, and, and a matter of fact, I told you this story when we were talking, my, my old third grade teacher, I, I had asked her, I said, um, why, why'd you retire? And, or, or not my, my third grade, one of my old teachers said, why'd you retire? She said, when I, when I, um, when I caught a third grader behind the, the shed having sex with another third grader, she goes, I walked in and retired. I'm like, that wasn't happening when I was in third grade. Like, that you know it. Mm, true. Very true. At least but it wasn't yeah, for me. And ag <laughs> yeah. That, and again, that's a fair like point. Most people don't have parents to be able to explain all this information to them before they get that adequate sex ed in school. So yeah. they may be 
fall into situations where they um, are having sex at such a young age. And so by providing the proper sex education, then they know the consequences of their actions. Yep. Oh man, this, this topic is just really, it's upsetting for me as a parent, you know, um, as a man, I, I feel like I, I, I wasn't educating myself enough and all I can do is tell you that I'll do better with my son. I, yeah. All right. So before we wrap this up, did I miss anything? Is there any other points you, you ladies would like to drive home? Call your legislators. Yes. Call them all, bug them, you know, make sure that they know what you think. And, but I also want to drive the one point somebody made in the beginning of the show. I don't remember which one of you it was that more people and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it wasn't it more people said no to this bill when it was pushed out that more people had, had, had said no on the request to speak that they didn't want it. Yeah, that's right. At the committee hearing, um, they ran out of people supporting the bill and the people testifying one after another were saying we shouldn't have this bill it'll it will disempower students to identify sexual abuse it'll it'll attack the lgbt community it'll it'll hurt students is basically what one person after another said and it still passed the committee that's not representation that Sorry, that that's nope. that's a complete de degradation of representation in the state. When 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 the the constituents are all showing up, the one that, that show up and say this is not no, this isn't good, and they still do it. What is that? That's not representing the people. And you can't say, well, I know I know what the majority of my constituents would would think. No, you need to go off of the people that show up and give you their opinion, because you can't negate. What everybody showing up says by saying, "Oh well, I know better," because that's that's what they just did. It's ridiculous. All right, and with that being said, ladies, thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope that this this gets out, and um, if I can ever help you again, I promise to do better with the videos next time. You, you guys are always welcome to come on the show if there's another bill that comes out and you want to get it out there. Just send me a message, and we'll make it happen. So for everybody out there that's listening, go follow them on Instagram and Twitter, Sex Education for a Change in Arizona. Uh, you won't regret it. They're putting out great information, doing good work for, for our future and, and our schools here in Arizona. So thank you, SB 1456. Remember, it's a vote no. And we have all the representative's information in the description here. And I'll put the, as a, on our way out, I'm going to go ahead and put this graphic up and go ahead and Remember, contact everybody, bug them, tell them what you think, make sure they understand that this is not okay and we will not accept this. And with that, I'll leave you as I always do. Much love. Keep fighting.